the words for some people I met surprised me, and I noticed with sorrow that they were no longer as confident as in the past. I was chagrined by this. However, we were approaching the time to launch our campaign, and I said to myself that if the emperor emerged victorious from the struggle that was about to be begin, those people would change their tune. After a period of incredible activity, backed by the nation, the emperor had put it in a state of defense. He was leaving behind him a few seeds of dissent, but counted on a victory to dispel them. The chambers convened on June 8th, and on the 11th, the emperor received a deputation from the chamber of deputies at the Elysee. These deputies thanked the emperor for relinquishing the extraordinary powers he held in order to proclaim the beginning of a constitutional monarchy. They assured him of the chamber's cooperation in the defense of the national independence and promised him to actively support the constitution. The royal charter, not having been approved by the people, could not be considered an obligation by the nation. Regaining that day full exercise of its rights, rallying around the hero to whom its faith again entrusted the state government, France was surprised and saddened to see armed sovereigns asking it for justification of an internal change, which was a result of national will and threatened neither existing relations with other governments nor their safety. France could not accept the conditions with which the Allied nations were trying to veil their aggression. To attack the monarch of its choice was to attack the independence of the nation. It was fully armed to defend this independence and to repel, without exception, any family or any prince they would dare to impose on it. The emperor replied, Monsieur le Président and deputies of the chamber, I find with great satisfaction my own sentiments in those you have just expressed in these grave circumstances my thoughts are absorbed by the imminent war to whose success are tied the independence and honor of france i shall leave tonight to place myself at the head of my armies the movements of the various foreign enemy corps make my presence there indispensable during my absence I would be pleased to see a commission named by each chamber to reflect on our constitution. It is our rallying point and must be our North Star in these stormy times. Any political discussion that would tend to directly or indirectly diminish the necessary trust in its measures would be unfortunate for the state. We would find ourselves navigating among shoals without compass or rudder. Our present crisis is a major one. Let us not follow the example of the lower empire, which, pressed on all sides by barbarians, made itself the laughing stock of posterity by concerning itself with abstract concepts at the very moment when battering rams were breaking down the city gates. Independent from the legislative measures that internal circumstances necessitate, you may find it useful to concern yourselves with laws instrumental to the upholding of the Constitution. These can be the subject of public work without any inconvenience. Monsieur le Président and deputies of the Chamber, the sentiments expressed in your speech show me sufficiently the attachment of the Chamber to my person and all the patriotism that moves it. In all my undertakings, my step shall always be straight and firm. Help me to save the motherland. As the last representative of the people, I have contracted the obligation that I now renew to use in quieter times in all the Crown's prerogatives and the little experience I have acquired to help you improve our institutions. That same night at 10 p.m., the emperor went home accompanied by Prince Joseph, who handed him a large quantity of diamonds. I learned later they amounted to 800,000 francs. They were each wrapped separately. Giving these to me, the emperor told me to lock them in the secret compartment of his traveling kit along with Princess Pauline's necklace, estimated at 300,000 francs. This kit had its place in the emperor's carriage. He also handed me two thick packages sealed with his crest, telling me to take one to Countess Valeska and the other to Madame Plapra. I returned to the Elysee only at 1 a.m. During the day, the emperor had been kind enough to grant my father a position as state messenger, vacant through the death of one of these, and told me to have the decree to that effect prepared by the Duke of Asano, Murray. The unfortunate events of Waterloo prevented the execution of that decree. On the 12th at 4 a.m., the emperor left to rejoin the army, taking with him his ADCs, military aides, and two pages, Messieurs Godin and de Cambacerets. 
he left a regency council composed of Prince Joseph as president, Prince Lucian, the eight ministers with portfolios and four ministers of state, all of whom were to decide by majority vote. In the event of a tie, the president's vote would decide. On leaving Paris, the emperor visited the fortifications in Soissons and slept at Lyon. On the 13th, he arrived at Evesne, where all the troops were concentrated, and on the 14th, reminded them in a proclamation that the anniversary of Marengo and Friedland had twice decided the destiny of Europe. The emperor, who had given a command to General Bourmont, only at the request of General Gerard, soon learned that this general, followed by Colonel Clouet Villoutre du Beray and two general staff officers had gone over to the enemy. He knew his battle plan and was able to apprise the enemy of it. He immediately made changes in his plan of attack. On the 15th, the French army crossed the Sabre at Charras, encountered some light troops on the other side and crushed them, taking prisoners. At 10 a.m., the emperor entered Charroi, and the army took a position before that city on the road to Fleurus. An enemy division of some eight to 10,000 men straddling this road was pushed back. The infantry overwhelmed by the cavalry, but France lost General Latour. That evening, when the emperor returned to his headquarters, he was thoughtful and troubled by the death of his ADC, saying not one word while undressing. He gave orders for the army divisions to enter the plain of Fleru that had been distinguished 20 years earlier by the finest military feats of the French army. On the 16th, the enemy army arranged in the shape of an amphitheater on a hillside behind the villages of saint Armand and Ligny was ready for battle. At noon, it began with the greatest enthusiasm. The leader's fervor and the soldier's valor triumphed over the energetic resistance offered, and they remained masters of the battlefield. Such a fine beginning to a campaign led to the greatest hopes. The next day, when I crossed the battlefield, I saw what the horrors of war had brought about. It was covered with dead and wounded, the latter being tended by medical officers left there for that purpose. The enemy army split in two, took off in two directions. On the 17th, the emperor pursued the British heading for Brussels and slept at Plants Noir at a small farm where he established his headquarters. While Marshal, Marshal Grouchy, at the head of an army corps of 40,000 men, followed the Prussians towards the Meuse, the emperor said he could have hoped for more from the brilliant success he had just achieved, and the outcome of the battle could have been decided had Marshal Ney carried out his orders by bearing on the rear of the enemy army. Saint-Denis told me that during the most intense moment of the Ligny battle, Hearing laughter behind him, the emperor turned around sharply and said to the young military aide who had attracted his attention, Be a little more serious, sir, when faced with all these brave men killing each other. I arrived, arrived at headquarters much later than the emperor. My carriage had overturned in a stream, and it had taken several hours to get it out. Night had fallen, it was very dark, and heavy rain made the roads difficult to manage. We went past headquarters, and the coachman drove me to the main guard post, where I was stopped, I turned back and finally arrived at the Caillou farmhouse. The emperor had gone to bed an hour before, telling saint -Denis of his astonishment at my not having arrived. I had been there barely two hours when he called me and asked what the weather was like. I told him of the accident that had delayed me, the poor condition of the roads, and the rain that continued to fall. At 3 a.m., he summoned his senior military aide, Colonel Gorgo telling him to go reconnoiter the terrain and see if the artillery could maneuver. His impatience to attack was visible. The enemy had remained in position before the Soigne forest. It had been believed the previous night that it had taken up that position only to give its convoys time to cross the forest. Supplies had not arrived. The weather had been awful that night and several days march, a great battle and other combats had tired the troops. They needed to see the sun at daybreak to dry out and recover from the night's fatigue. Colonel Drouot reported the roads were so damaged and the ground so wet that he didn't believe the artillery could maneuver until things dried out a little. After this report, the emperor remained in bed but arose early, pleased to see the weather clearing. He was quartered in a small square room 
the furniture that had been there having been tossed into the courtyard and it served as bedroom, study, and dining room. He paced back and forth in that room a long time, hands behind his back. Then he took a pair of scissors and ran them around his nails, appearing much more concerned with the battle that was about to begin than with the detail of his appearance. He often went to the window and looked at the skies. Once he had shaved, he dressed and summoned General Gorgo, who wrote under his dictation. At 9 a.m., the emperor asked for his breakfast, which he shared with Prince Jerome. General Rai, who commanded the Second Corps under the prince and a few other generals who were invited. The emperor said to them cheerfully as he got up from the table, Gentlemen, if my orders are carried out well, we shall sleep in Brussels tonight. He told Saint-Denis to bring his horses and mounted, followed by his general staff. The emperor's arrival was greeted all along the line by a thousand cries of vive l'empereur, cries of love if ever they were. When the emperor felt the ground had sufficiently dried to permit maneuvering, he ordered the second court to attack the Hougoumont Woods, located before the enemy's right. At noon, Prince Jerome's division moved forward to take it, was driven back, and regrouped for a second attack. The prince was able to take it only after a very stubborn battle, in which he was wounded. At the same time, the attack was going on. The first court moved into the houses of Mont Saint-Jean while approaching the enemy's position. The British, left to themselves, seemed to be unable to hold out against the combined efforts of the French army. The emperor was waiting for an opportune moment. I returned to headquarters, sure that a great battle was about to be won, when around 5 p.m., Novras came to tell me that a Prussian corps had joined the British. General Lobau's division was facing it, and the battle raged on. I was worried in spite of myself by the enemy's persistence, and became more so when Sun Denis came galloping in to fetch something for the emperor, saying to me, great haste, things are going badly. We just saw masses of troops in the distance. We first thought it was Marshal Grouchy, and a joyful cry went up, but it's Marshal Blucher's corps, and we have no news of Marshal Grouchy. The emperor cannot understand why he did not arrive at the same time. And he left at a gallop. It was then 7 p.m. I was reflecting sadly. General Bulow had already added his numerical force to the British army. The emperor had shown no anxiety over it since he had dispatched a courier to Paris to announce that the battle had been won. But the arrival of Marshal Blucher's army increased this numerical strength excessively against a tired army. It could change a day that was to raise the French army's glory to new heights into a day of sorrow if Marshal Grouchy did not arrive. I mentioned my fears to General Foulet, the emperor's equerry, who told me that we should take great care to show nothing, adding that it was against his advice that the equipment train was located so close to the battlefield. But since it was there, nothing short of an order from the emperor would make it withdraw. About an hour went by, and the noise of the artillery and the rifle fire seemed to be coming appreciably closer to us. Night had not yet fallen when we saw the road filled with artillery trains and wounded soldiers being held up by men who were not. This retreat was taking on an alarming character. I had the emperor's bed placed temporarily in its case, shut the travel kit, and readied myself for any eventuality. The emperor's carriage was on the battlefield. This did not worry me in spite of its containing a large sum of gold, Princess Pauline's necklace, and the diamonds added by Prince Joseph the night of the departure from Paris. Believing that the carriage could always make it through, I even congratulated myself on not having all these valuables with me. I was already quite encumbered by those I had in gold, amounting to 100,000 francs and 300,000 in banknotes, which I kept locked in a large travel kit that fitted in my carriage. Soon we no longer heard the gunfire approaching, but someone came to ask the officer and the men assigned to guarding the carriages to move into the nearby woods and prevent the enemy from entering it to give time for them to be moved away. Fate had just turned the outcome of the battle against us. The best plan devised to vanquish and destroy the enemy's hopes to bring him to peace was overturned by the non-execution of the emperor's orders to one of his lieutenants, Marshal Grouchy. Had he forced the enemy at sword point as he had been told to do, he would have arrived on the battlefield at the same time to take part in victory rather than bringing about the army's defeat. Fate had it that the guard was engaged in battle at the moment Marshal Blucher's corps arrived, as were the service squadron that were never deployed except by order of the emperor. 
Thus, at the most critical moment, the emperor no longer had underhand the reserve that he so brilliant utilized at a given moment to recapture a victory that might elude him. General Foulet, hearing the gunfire in the woods getting closer to the carriages, had taken upon himself to order them pulled back. It was already a little late in view of the congestion along the road. I had the emperor's bed placed on a mule on the travel kit put in my carriage. It was hitched to a powerful team and was soon pulled out from where it had been parked. But once on the road, had to travel like everything else. I nonetheless thought it was saved until arriving at the Quatre Bras intersection, where the congestion became such that it couldn't get through. I wanted to see what was causing this problem. An accursed mortar blocked the way and was stopping all that arrived, which meant that in an instant, a mass of carriages were across the highway and prevented passage. The enemy also stopped, was looting the last cars, and mine was about to fall prey. At once, I opened the travel kit, grabbed the 300,000 francs in banknotes, placed these on my chest, buttoned up my uniform over them, and abandoned the rest. With much difficulty, I managed to go from one carriage to another and emerge from the bottleneck in which I was caught. The Duke of Bassano, Murray, and Baron Faint took off on foot, their carriages remaining in the middle of this mess like me. They were without news of the emperor, whom some said had been killed, and others said he wished to sleep on the battlefield. How could we believe any of them, considering the disorder in which they were retreating? I was unsure and waited until I saw the guard that was following the movement, but in somewhat better order. I asked several officers if they knew the route taken by the emperor. None of them could tell me. I therefore set off with them. The cannon had long ago become silent. This guard, so brilliant the day before, so enthusiastic that very morning, was now hurrying along the road, bleak and silent, full of worried. I followed it and marched all night and all the next day, passing through Beaumont and Charlois. I arrived at nightfall in Vesna. Its gates were closed. I learned that Prince Jerome, wounded, was inside, as were the emperor's horses. I spent the night at a dragoon bivouac, moving up close to one of the fires. Luck would have it that I recognized an old comrade among the officers who offered to share with me a piece of bread he was eating. I thanked him, and we chatted about our misfortunes and our fear that our unfortunate motherland would once more be exposed to the ravages of foreigners. I thus waited for the Avesna gates to open, and before long saw the service horses coming out. Led by Amodru, the elven groom, I ran up to him and asked, what happened to the emperor? I don't know, he replied with tears in his eyes. I got on one of the horses and rode to Leon, sad and worried at not knowing what route the emperor had taken. Once there, I dropped down on some straw to get a little rest. I hardly had stretched out when I was told the emperor was at the post house in town. My fatigue vanished instantly. The emperor was alive. France could still be saved. The army might perhaps rally near the city. I ran to the post house. The first person I saw was Saint-Denis, who told me the emperor's carriage had been captured along with all that was in it. The loss of the battle had been too much on my mind for that of the diamonds and money to make much of an impression. I was sorry only about the loss of Princess Pauline's necklace, which had been moistened by her tears and her words. The emperor Minutus came back to me and made me sad. I went in to the emperor. Count Bertrand was with him. Both were very calm, but appeared absolutely exhausted. I told him how my carriage had been seized at the Quatre Bras intersection and how I had only been able to save the banknotes that were in it, having come from there on foot all the way to Vesna, and that I was deeply saddened to learn that His Majesty's carriage and the valuables it contained had been seized. It's a misfortune, he replied, and went on enumerating the resources left of France if he was backed by the chambers. The equipment lost as well as the supplies would easily be replaced. And rallying the army in Lyon, the enemy could be contained, giving the nation time to pull itself together. Having heard only bits and pieces of the emperor's conversation, I recall this spoken to General Bertrand as I came in. If I return to Paris and dip my hand in blood, I will have to plunge it in all the way to the elbow. The name of Fouché was then brought up and seemed to be a target for his vengeance when he left the Waterloo battlefield. The emperor had proceeded to Philippeville, where he arrived with a handful of cavalrymen from all units, and there he found the Duke of Bassano, Murray, and a few officers of his staff. After spending the night sending out staff orders, he wrote to Prince Joseph and headed for Leon, along with Grand Marshal Bertrand, the Duke of Bassano, and his ADCs, Generals Flau and Labadoyer, and Monsieur Godin, his page. 
Another page, Monsieur de Commissaire, had been taken prisoner the day before. As the emperor wished the chambers of the country to know the whole truth about the situation, he prepared the battle report and sent it to Paris by courier. If in rallying his army near Lyon, the emperor had intended to stay there, it was doubtless only for a moment, for he ordered me to take a stagecoach and go to the Elysee, where he intended to be the next day. I preceded him by only a few hours. His friends, fearing for his safety, saw danger in a decision that would place him in the midst of factions where passions were brewing and thought he was in much stronger position at the head of the army than he could possibly be in Paris. The emperor, solely concerned with saving the country and not his person, felt that a rapid and truthful account of events would awaken the patriotic sentiments of the representatives and that with him, there the chambers would not despair of the salvation of the motherland. Backed by them, the nation would rise as a man and the emperor would restore good fortune to our flag. Imbued by this feeling of love for the country, he feared losing neither his throne nor his life. The nation and the army did not fail him, but the chambers failed the country. On June 21st, the emperor arrived at the Elysee at 5.30 a.m. He was greeted on the steps by the Duke of Vicenza, Calancourt, to whom he could pour out the sorrow in his heart and the intensity of his spirit. He summoned Count de Lavalette, who arrived promptly. The emperor had not removed his boots since the battle, and the officers accompanied him, as well as he, were exhausted. I asked if his majesty wished to have his bath prepared, and he said he needed one to refresh himself. Paris, which had fallen asleep in the enthusiasm of the victory at Ligny, could not understand this unexpected return of the emperor. The word treason was beginning to be repeated from mouth to mouth when the Waterloo Bulletin arrived, telling of our misfortunes and our alternatives. The Bulletin, once known in Paris, caused agitation, and the passions which the emperor was sure to extinguish with the victory released their full fury against him on his return. Once the bath was ready, the emperor entered it. The Duke of Vicenza, Calancourt, and Count de Lavalette accompanied him to the bathroom. As he was getting in, the emperor told the Duke of Vicenza to assemble the Council of Ministers and sent reprimands to Marshals Ney and Grouchy for not carrying out the orders they must have received. He said, what a strange destiny. For three times I saw France's assured triumph slip through my hands, but for a traitor's desertion. I would have annihilated the enemy at the outside of the campaign, crushed at Ligny if the left flank had done its duty, a Christian at Waterloo if the right flank had not failed in its duty. Well, all is not lost. After great feats of valor, panic seized the army. I am going to present to the chambers an accurate account of what happened, and I hope that the presence of the enemy on French soil will restore the deputies' sense of duty and that my honesty will rally them around me. At the first rumor of the emperor's arrival, Barons and Menival had rushed to the Elysee. He was shown in to the emperor as he was about to return to his bedroom. I thought the emperor was going to go to bed for a moment, as he habitually did, but he said he was going to dress in shape. At the same instant, Princes Joseph and Lucien were shown in, and he talked to them about the preceding events. Prince Lucien told them that as soon as our misfortunes were known, people became agitated and that the worst could be expected from the deputy's deliberation because of the ill will of a few members. The emperor replied, you must count Lafayette among those. He will not fail to stir up the people against me. They imagine that the allies are the only after me personally and do not see that in parting with me, they will lose France.